No, we didn't call him gay. Because I don't think we'd ever use gay in a derogatory term. You know what I mean? Um, it's weird. There's like this, some kind of weird feud that started. I think Axel started talking some nonsense on stage in Florida. So what exactly was Chris Novoselic of Nirvana referring to when he talked about Axel talking smack at a show in Florida? So Guns N' Roses were on tour with Metallica at the time, and this was about a week before the 1992 MTV Video Music Awards happened. The infamous awards were Axel and Kirk got into it backstage. So it was about a week before that Guns were playing in Orlando and Axel took some time to go off on Nirvana and alternative bands. He said he was basically criticizing alternative bands at the time, like some of those grunge bands for not wanting to be famous and have a lot of people enjoy their music and basically saying how he didn't understand that. And then he also referred to Kurt and Courtney as junkies and thinking that their babies should be taken away from them and they should basically be locked up in jail. And that's kind of all that Axel really said at that show, referring to Nirvana and the grunge bands. Said some mean things. And then uh, when we were at the MTV Music Awards, um, Kurt and Courtney said something to him. Like, I think Kurt was holding their baby. And Courtney said, like, Axel, you're going to be the godfather. You're going to be the godfather. And he got mad and he told him to shut up. And then one thing led to another. It's really silly. And then... Uh, we said some nasty things about him at this show in um, Portland, Oregon. It was a benefit show for the No on Nine, this measure that was going to discriminate against homosexuals in Oregon. Some fascist law, you know what I mean? Franco would have been proud. But, um, and then... You know, yesterday, uh, my wife and I were sitting in a tent at the MTV Music Awards. And we were having, we're having lunch. And Axel Rose walked by us. And, and we yelled at Axel, we said, Axel, will you be the godfather of our child? And he said, he stopped, he turned around, he pointed his finger at my with wife. With his he bodyguard? Said, yeah, well, he had like 20 bodyguards with him, and, and he's doing uh, the Madonna documentary, he's got his little film camera with him. And, and you had a three-week-old baby in your arms. And I had a little helpless child in my arms. And so he said to my wife, you better shut up, bitch. Don't pitch me any shit tonight. Because tonight was obviously the highlight of his career. Look at the last night. Was. He said so. And, and then I said, and then he said, and then he looked at me and he said, "You better keep your wife shut, or I'm gonna take you to the pavement." I, I was shaking and I, I went, "What? What? You're gonna? What are you gonna do? You're gonna beat me up?" And he said. You better keep your wife's mouth shut. You embarrass everybody. You embarrass your wife, you embarrass your old man, you embarrass me. And, and, and then I, I was shaking and I said, I told my wife to shut up, bitch. True <laughs> <laughs> story, you heard it here first. That's so. <laughs> and then I ran into Duff McKagan. Oh. And that guy wanted to fight me. And he had three bodyguards who were like pushing me around. But it's about, but see, that's the establishment rock and roll, see. What? They want you to buy their package rebellion of sitting on a Harley Davidson while you play uh, uh, piano with a 41 piece orchestra, just like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer did in 1978. Say it, brother. Hey, man. I'm not sticking up for Axel or anything, <laughs> but I'm not going to stick up for Kurt, man. Well, you got to take sides. Either you're no. yes on nine no, or you're wait. no on nine, man. You got to take yeah. sides. No on nine, but I'm talking about Axel here. Just hang on a second. You're talking about an asshole? <laughs> man, I just guys. I think you guys should let music be music, man. Let everybody express what they want, man. Yeah. Be it hard rock, be it Nirvana, right be on, it man. anyone, man. Just yeah. let them rock the way they want to rock, yeah, okay? Right, right on, man, but All right? that's a corporate establishment. Which but you can't really let a rock star who obviously likes to beat women and likes to control women and who likes to tell women to shut up. And who is niggers and people? Obviously, is a racist.
racist and a homophobe. He doesn't have the right to speak his mind. Well, he does have the right to speak his mind, no, but so do we, and he should I'm be shut up. I'm not sticking up for him, man. What happened? And then he said some bad stuff about us on stage in Seattle, but he got booed because he couldn't get away with that in our town. And uh, I, we haven't heard anything else from him. And it, it, it's basically really silly stuff, you know. I think it's kind of funny. And if I if I can if I can instigate more stuff, I will, just for the heck of it, you know. I'd like to meet him. I've met him once briefly, you know. Hi, how are you? And that's it. But. I'd like to meet with him and maybe discuss things, resolve a few things, maybe engage in some kind of dialogue. Maybe we can have some uh, negotiations mediated by David Geffen in his office, you know. We'll have our list of demands and they'll have their list of demands and we'll just do some process of elim elimination. We'll find some common ground and, and we'll have a... It'll probably hold like a Sarajevo ceasefire, but it'll be worth a try. <laughs> So Chris Novoselic's, you know, memory of all those events are really good because, in fact, Guns N' Roses did play Seattle and Axel did go off on Nirvana in Seattle's hometown. So Guns N' Roses were scheduled to play Seattle uh, in August of 1992 with Metallica. But of course, because of the pyrotechnic incident that happened in Montreal, that concert got delayed to September of 92. And then it once again got delayed to October 6th of 92, about a month after the MTV Movie Awards or the Music Awards, I should say. And it was really the it was actually the last show of the GNR Metallica tour. And Axel told the audience how good Seattle pot was, and later he made fun of Bill Clinton for inhaling but not smoking. He also discussed the presidential election and debates the candidates, especially Al Gore and his wife. If you guys remember, Tipper Gore was part of these this parent group that was trying to basically put these ad parental advisory stickers on all of the you know controversial artists back in the 80s and early 90s so during that concert double talk and jive was dedicated to al gore's wife tipper gore which i'm going to be doing a whole episode on later on in my channel and axel thanks seattle for all the great rock and roll that comes out of it then he took the time to go off on nirvana and kurt cobain calling kurt cobain um, basically calling Kurt Cobain's wife a whore in his own words. And before the show, Axel was actually asked by security guards if he had a pass to be backstage, which was funny. And it was during that time that Axel got booed by the audience. So after the show, Axel tells the crowd that they'll be playing arena dates next spring and to keep their eyes open if they're interested, referring to the Skin and Bones tour. Now, I was able to dig up a review from that show back from 1992. The review read, Guns and Metallica show, yes, it was loud and long. And it read, Guns and Roses and Metallica and Motorhead at the Kingdome last night. Some of the other setlist almanacs I've seen say that Body Count opened that show, but I haven't seen that referenced in this review. Could be just a mistake. So it says, looking down at the Kingdome floor during, any, during anything but a sporting event always feels like, when are the RVs going to get here? Where are the monster trucks? Are the sportsmen coming? Is this the home show? Last night, no, it was a rock show and 37,000 fans showed up for it. What they got was roughly seven and a half hours of lights, camera, some action, long waits, portable cans, big screen televisions, fireworks, and music. Some of it great music, some of it not. The Guns Metallica show happened, it basically began on time at 6.30, basically with Motorhead starting. The reality bass band closest in the spirit to Spinal Tap. If lead singer and bassist Lemmy isn't the godfather of metal, he must certainly be the evil stepfather. He and Motorhead roared and rumbled through their set like an alcoholic garbage truck. Low, mean, fast when it was when it had to be an ultimately comic dumpster destroyers. At one point, Lemmy told the crowd, I want you to go out and buy the album because I want your money. The evening's one true moment of solidarity was when Slash joined in for a song. Now, Motorhead's humor went out the window when Metallica came on stage at 7.50. The band in black turned into the most consistent set of the evening, which was two and a half hours of intense in-your-face energy, a sandbelt grinder on the super sped assault. Now, lead singer James Heffield, still on the injured list from the burn he received in an onstage accident, performed all but the final encore without his guitar. Hetfield is no Mick Jagger, or for that matter, Axl Rose, but he got around pretty well. And the brand reached all the way back to its first album during the set, highlighting the title cut Kill Em All when Hetfield jumped into the pit between the stage and the front barricade, slapped hands, and stuck his microphone into the mob as they sang the songs Search and Destroy Chorus. The reviewer went on to say, and the sound was dismal. What highs there were were hideously distorted. Even the best playing both Kirk Hammett in Metallica and Slashes with GNR was often lost in the thunder. Fortunately, there wasn't much echo. Having the sound return would have been unbearable. 
So Metallica wrapped up their spectacular visual battlefield of one and the final encore enter Sandman. It was a good close and unfortunately the band didn't seem to know how to get off stage. An hour later after the PA sounded Queen's We Will Rock You, then Perry Mason's theme, Guns N' Roses roared out with Night Train. After hearing Metallica, you realize just how pop G&R can be. But it galvanized the crowd and the reaction was unanimous. Everyone was ready and willing to scream, this show was on fire. But it started fading after three songs. There were flashes of light to come, Some White Hot, Live and Let Die got immediate response, Civil War had way more kick than expected, and Welcome to the Jungle was great despite the giant inflatable bugs in the 300 level. You Could Be Mine, Sweet Child of Mine, Knocking on Heaven's Door, and The Final Paradise City was stellar, but Slash noodling away on Wild Horses to Axel and Duff's vocals was awful. November Rain is an overblown production piece, although mighty popular with those ballad lovers, and Patience didn't gel. The playing was at times stellar and then just as quickly slop. Rose taking on the lumber industry, the candidates, Tipper Gore and Nirvana was lame. As were his costume changes, we already have a Diana Ross. There were times when it was easy to see why this group is justifiably considered one of the all-time great rock and roll bands, but there was many moments when the huge entertainment purely smacked of Vegas. As much of an audience, as much as the audience loved them, a lot didn't make it to that 2 a.m. closing the review the reviewer closed with. So that does it for today's video, guys. Let me know your thoughts. Did any of you guys go to the Seattle show? And unfortunately, the reviewer didn't talk about the crowd's response to when he went off on Nirvana, but the other setlist almanac I looked at didn't say anything about the lumber industry and Axel's rant against it, but I know there is audio of the Seattle show somewhere out there. So thanks for watching, guys. Hope you guys have a good day, and leave your comments in the comment section below, and go check us out at gnrcentral.com for the latest GNR news. Take care.